I have a question for the kids. How are your parents at being math teachers right now? <laughs> not, not so good, right? You see, uh, well, parents, maybe I should ask you, how do you feel about the situation? When kids are young, it's one thing with teaching them math. When they get older, eh, it's a different story, right? My daughter is a junior at West Aurora High School. She is taking pre-calculus. I took pre-calculus when I was a junior in high school in 1989. I was okay at it. There is not a chance that I could help her right now. And to be honest, uh, I, I really wouldn't want to do junior high algebra right now. You know, I would feel kind of like Mr. Incredible in The Incredibles 2 trying to teach Dash math. I don't know if you remember this scene. Dash is, that's not the way you're supposed to do it, Dad. They want us to do it this way. I don't know that way. Right? Why would they change math? Math is math. Math is math. He is completely exasperated. And it's particularly funny for me because the guy that was the inspiration for Mr. Incredible happens to be the principal at West Aurora High School. Now, he claims that this is a myth. It's not true, but he went to college with the guy who started it, and if you see him, if you hear him, you know it's true. Now, you could say that I have backslidden when it comes to my math skills, and I bet that most of us, as adults, who are not scientists or engineers or math teachers, could say the same thing. I mean, I'm mostly a writer and an editor. I don't use pre-calculus in my day-to-day -day life. And most of us, when it comes down to it, things like pre-calculus, if we backslide, it's not that big of a deal, unless you're a student, or if you are the engineer who is designing my car, or the bridge my car drives on, or the plane that I fly on. Then, Knowing your pre-calculus matters, and you better do it. But as we're going to see today in Hebrews chapter 5, that spiritual backsliding is not an insignificant thing. We're in verses 11 to 14, and we're going to see that spiritual backsliding is like a silent spiritual disease. We often don't recognize it until it gets right up on us and it's dangerous. Here is what the writer of Hebrews says. We have much to say about this. He's looking back to what he had just started, talking about Jesus' as great high priest in the order of Melchizedek that we heard about last week. But it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge of difficult passages like this, which call us on the carpet when we need it. And I pray that through this passage today, we would understand a little more clearly who you are and how we are to live in light of that. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, in that scene, Mr. Incredible is exasperated. Dash is exasperated. It's an exasperating situation, right? And we get exasperated when things that should be simple take too much effort, right? We get exasperated when the people that we are working with Someone who ought to know better doesn't. 
It's exasperating. And that's the situation we're faced with today in our passage. The writer of Hebrews is exasperated. I want to go deeper, he says. I want to teach you the good stuff, but I can't. How can I make something clear to you when you won't even try to understand? You should be better than this. You should, in fact, be able to know this stuff well enough to teach it yourself. But I think you need to go back and get a refresher on the times tables, which you should have learned in third grade. Of course, we're not talking about times tables, right? We're talking about their faith, about the state of their souls, about the direction they're headed. In fact, he's so exasperated that he basically interrupts his entire train of thought on Jesus' high priest and says, wait. He calls out his audience. He's kind of like that teacher that gets so mad at her unruly and inattentive class that she stops everything and yells and calls them out. We've all been in that situation. You know the shocked silence afterwards, the pin drop moment? That's kind of what's going on here. And why does that happen? Well, we need to realize first that that teacher, the writer of Hebrews, the pastor or the parent, is not exasperated because they don't care. It's not because they're mad and mean. It's because they care a lot, right? They want the best for that person. And it really matters a great deal when someone that you care about stops doing the right thing or starts engaging in self-destructive behavior. And the writer of Hebrews is about to drop the hammer on his audience because he cares. This is not some Facebook rant or tweet storm about or toward an enemy. This is the people he loves and cares for. And sometimes we have to have those tough conversations. We have to hear those hard words for our own good. And that's what's going on here. So I see two things that are exasperating our writer. First is a lack of desire. Verse 11 says they aren't even trying to understand anymore. And we don't know why. Maybe they've gotten overwhelmed by the situation that they're facing. And they're retreating into themselves. And frankly, that's not so hard for us to understand right now. Or maybe they're coasting. You know, I've done this spiritual thing long enough. I've got it under control. I can cut the engine and just drift along for a while and my momentum will carry me on. Maybe that's what they're thinking. Or it could be that, like a couple of chapters ago, chapter 3, they are like the children of Israel in the desert, and their hearts have been hardened. We don't know, but in any case, they have given up trying. In the ESV, it says that they become dull of hearing. The NLT says you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. I like the way uh, George Guthrie put it in his commentary, that the word that's used here means culpable negligence or sluggishness in some aspect of life. They're responsible. And the question we have to ask ourselves when we come to a passage like this is, am I, are you, satisfied with where you are spiritually? And if we're satisfied... If we think that everything's okay, we're in trouble. We're in trouble and we might not even know it. And we are like these Hebrew Christians that lack the desire to grow. And as we look at this passage, we've got this infant adult thing going on, right? And maybe you're tempted to think about, well, Matthew 18, Jesus says that you need to become like little children. And we do. But... We have to remember what he's talking about there. You see, Jesus had been asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And his response was, become like a child. Why did he say that? Because in that culture, in that world, a child had no status, no standing at all. What is he saying? He's saying, you have to be willing to be of no status. He's not talking about maturity. 
Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, that famous love chapter, you get to verse 11 says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. What is he getting at? Maturity is something that we all should aspire to. It's a natural part of life. If we're not growing, and, and it happens fast, every parent can tell you this, I have a 16 year old going on 30. I remember yesterday she was that tall. It happens overnight, but maturity is an important thing that's a natural part of life, and that leads us to this second exasperating thing, which is they've been lulled into laziness, right? It's closely related to that first problem, and sometimes that laziness grows out of a lack of desire to grow. Okay, I'm done, right? And sometimes it's because we come com become complacent. We've allowed the culture around us to sneak in and sing us lullabies. It's kind of like uh, the Greek myth in Homer of the sirens, right? The sirens were these creatures that would sing these songs that would lure the sailors and the ships would get crashed onto the rocks. And that happens to us and we don't even realize it. If you turn back a few pages, my Bible, it's about seven, to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 to 5, we see a pretty good illustration of this. Timothy is Paul's protege. And this letter is written from Paul when he's in a prison in Rome to Timothy in Ephesus, right? And this is what Paul says to Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now look, most of us aren't in Timothy's situation. But the situation there that's described sounds a whole lot like Hebrews 5. You see, Timothy's job was not to give in to the desire for the easy sermon, the things that you and I all want to hear, right? And this is particularly a problem for us today because with this thing, I can find any person any preacher at any moment to tell me exactly what I want to hear and I don't have to listen to anyone I don't want to hear. It's easy. It's easy to find preachers and pundits who will just repeat the things that we want to hear and make it sound so good, so Christian even. And we find voices to suit our own desires and we no longer have any desire to actually grow. I really appreciate... Uh, Russell Moore, I, I recently listened to a podcast where he was talking to preachers about their job, and it, he says, and, and I, I probably keep saying this, that to the preacher, if you have studied a passage and you're getting ready to preach it and there's nothing about that passage that bothers you, well, then you need to go back and study again because it will challenge you. And this is where we have to ask ourselves the even harder question, are we willing to expend the effort necessary to learn and grow? Being a person who didn't choose to be a homeschool parent, um, I'm having that battle right now. It's hard. And the writer says that they have been following Jesus long enough that they should be teachers. They are not new, but they're inattentive to the teachings, to the proclamation of the Bible. They only hear what they want to, and they're content not to be challenged, and that's a problem. 
And we need to ask ourselves, where are we like that today? Are we satisfied with our current standing? And if we are, we need to pay attention because we're in a dangerous spot and we don't realize it. We are in a situation not unlike this situation in Hebrews where the writer is about ready to play the part of doctor and start explaining some unrecognized symptoms. Several years ago, I had a problem. I had a problem and I didn't know I had a problem. It started with something really seemingly insignificant. And if I would have paid attention to the symptoms earlier, I would have saved myself a lot of pain. Not all of the pain, but at least some of it. You see, I started having trouble as I was driving, reading road signs that were farther away. I was past 40, everyone told me, well, after you're 40, it's gonna happen to your eyes. Your vision's gonna change. And so I thought, I haven't been to the eye doctor in a couple of years. That's what's going on here, right? The problem was that wasn't the only symptom. I started waking up in the middle of the night having to go to the bathroom a lot. I started craving sugary drinks. I didn't drink sugary drinks. And all of this was building and building. And then my sister, who is one of our missionaries in Uganda, we were having a dinner for her she was going back and I got sick and I thought I had food poisoning and finally I went to the doctor because my wife made me and the doctor said well your blood sugars are a little bit elevated but I'm not too worried about it right now um, get some rest make an appointment for a week for now and, and come in and see me two days later I was back in the doc at the doctor with my wife that time different doctor and she looked at me and she said I could rerun these tests from Tuesday but I know what they're going to tell me and they're going to run them anyway when you go to the ER and you are going to the ER right now and she looked at my wife and made her promise to take me over to the ER and I was in waiting to get into the ER and in the bathroom vomiting and there was nothing left and I almost passed out and not very much longer, I was diagnosed as being in ketoacidosis and I had latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. And I spent four days in the ICU step-down unit to get my sugars under control. It was not fun. I carry insulin wherever I go. I have an app that I am literally plugged into and every five minutes it checks my blood sugar. I had symptoms that I only recognized after the fact. After a doctor pointed them out to me. And that's the situation we're in here today. That's what the writer of Hebrews is doing to these listeners. He's saying, stop. You don't even recognize it. Symptom number one, you are unproductive. You should be teachers by now. But you need someone to teach you the elementary truths again. The again is important because it's not that they don't know anything or they didn't know anything. It's that their laziness led them to forget what they had known. It's kind of like me in pre-calculus. I lost my capacity. But in this case, it's worse because pre-calculus is advanced math and this is basic arithmetic. Try do so, doing anything in life as an adult and you don't know basic math paying for things, making sure that you don't spend more than you have, figuring out how to calculate a tip, if we can ever go back to restaurants. You name it, life gets really hard. And these believers, they, they've become spiritually unproductive. They were unable to handle the most basic of things. And we need to, to understand this isn't about like your job as a teacher. This isn't becoming a pastor as a teacher. This is the kind of teaching that we all do with people around us who are younger or who don't know stuff that we have to learn. By this time, he says, and as a parent, I want my child to grow and become. And when my kids were little and I took them to the pediatrician, 
What do you do? You talk about milestones. You talk about, okay, they're in X percentile, whatever that means. And they, they talk about where they ought to be for that time. And as they get older, you want your children to learn to think for themselves and not to just follow the crowd. You want them to become productive members of society, and that's the picture here. When you are as old as you spiritually are, oh, listener to Hebrews, you ought to be better, and the lack of productivity is a sign of spiritual disease. Symptom two, they are undernourished. Our writer is getting personal here. You need milk, not solid food. You live on milk. And this is actually a serious insult. We hear this and we think, well, I'll go get the gallon of milk from the fridge. Maybe we think about the baby bottle. But in the Roman Empire, they did not have refrigeration. That's not what he's saying. He is basically accusing adults of being nursing babies. That is an insult. A mother's milk is completely appropriate if you are a baby. But sooner or later, you need solid food. And if you don't, you will be undernourished. An undernourished person is not capable of doing the things that they ought to be doing, taking on responsibilities, pursuing opportunities. An undernourished person cannot walk, cannot explore the wonders of the world around them, or experience the joys of life and connection. When you are undernourished in that way, you're always dependent on others. It's kind of like when you, the feeling when you've been sick with an extended illness, COVID or not, and you haven't eaten a lot, and you start to feel better, but what, is, what happens? You're wobbly, right? Because you need fuel, your body needs fuel. So these, these Christians are unproductive and undernourished, and symptom three is they're unchanged. This is kind of that symptom that puts them over the top when the disease really kicks in and, and everything cascades downward. And maybe this third symptom is kind of like me and my vision. I thought it was something else, a stage of life, a place on the way. But our writer says that because they're infants, they cannot or are not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. And there's this curious thing that happens with this word, righteousness. It's hard to get at in English because the same word that is treated, translated righteousness is the word for justice. And maybe you remember when I was here back in September and we were in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 5 to 14 and Jesus is superior to angels. And we ran into this same word. And we saw that righteousness and justice are connected and that in English, as we look at this word, one aspect, it focuses on the personal side, right? And that's the righteousness aspect. But the, the flip side, the justice side, is our interaction with others. But it's one word in Greek. It's also one word in Hebrew. And in his translation of this passage, N.T. Wright uses the word justice, not righteousness. And in his commentary on this passage, he says this. The word for justice is a tricky one. Wherever we meet it in the New Testament, it is often translated righteousness. But that gives people the impression that it's all about behaving yourself in a rather self-consciously religious fashion, which certainly isn't what Hebrews or the other early Christians had in mind. Justice doesn't quite catch the full flavor either, but at least it makes the point that the purposes of God in the gospel are focused on God's longing to put the world to rights and to put people to rights as part of that work. Scott McKnight, as I looked at this word a little bit further in the IVP Dictionary of the New Testament, says that it is about conduct in accordance with the requirements of a particular relationship. What does that mean? What it comes down to is this. When you read the word righteous, you better be thinking about justice. And when you read the word justice, you better be thinking about the word righteousness. They work together. Our personal conduct 
should work its way out, are the things that we do or don't do should work its way out into the way that we review our relationships with God and with others. And the way that we look out for others had better connect with our own personal lives. Christian belief is supposed to create life change. And these, these Hebrew believers were unchanged. Verse 14 basically says, you are infants, and you, because you're infants, you can't tell the difference between good and evil. Well, infants don't need to know the difference between good and evil. That's not where they're at in life. But adults do. And that's a sad statement if you're talking to adults. It's one with real consequences for them, for their church, and for their society as well. And if you'll notice, he doesn't give them a list here. Not even in next week's passage when we start to discuss these elementary truths, we don't get a list of do's and don'ts. He gives some broad categories of belief, and I think there's something really important that we need to wrestle with here. Because we have a tendency to create lists, right? Here's the respectable sin and the not-so-respectable sin. Here are the sins of others that are really bad, and we miss our own. Jerry Bridges was a longtime uh, staff member at The Navigators and a writer, and in his book, respectable sins, he says, those of us whom I call conservative evangelicals may have become so occupied with some of the major sins of society around us that we have lost sight of the need to deal with our own more refined sins. I think that's a really important warning for us all. Because we too are susceptible to exactly what these Hebrew believers face. We live in a culture that pressures us in lots of different ways to conform. And not only in the ones that we think are pressures for us to conform, because we find it easier to identify ourselves with our peers in the world around us than the teachings of Jesus. We find our identities in our sports teams, in our region. We find it in our ethnic or cultural associations, our political parties, all kinds of things, more than we do with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we don't have those same temptations to revert to Judaism that this audience did. But make no mistake, the pressure to trade in our faith for cultural goods, and I mean goods, is real. For these, this audience that the writer of Hebrews is writing to, they probably thought this move back to Judaism was a good thing because they're putting their family their national identity, even their ethnicity and their faith first in their own eyes, probably. But it really wasn't the case. Instead, it was the culmination of a real, silent, and sometimes deadly spiritual disease called backsliding. And we aren't that different. We too can make ourselves believe that we're headed in the right direction, or that we're okay when we're drifting from God, when we're turning ourselves actually into spiritual infants. So what do we do with a passage like this, this kind of warning passage? How do we find an elixir for our souls? You know, a medicine, something. And, and that's what this passage is, really. It is medicine. Hard medicine, doesn't taste very good. But it's medicine nonetheless. And, and the author does it in an interesting way here because you would think that he would say, okay, you guys, you're not listening. You can't even do the, the easy, right? You can't handle that. I got to go back. I got to start over. One plus one equals two. But that's not what he does at all. He gives them the warning and he challenges them. You need milk, he says. But as we're coming, you're going to find in the coming weeks, he doesn't go back to those elementary things. He goes right back to Jesus as a high priest. And what's going on here? Well, he's kind of like that teacher who just called out their student, right? Because what do students do after that pin drop moment? They tend to pay more attention. If for no other reason than to say, She's wrong. I'm going to prove her wrong. I can do this stuff. 
And that's what's going on. So how do we do this? How do we pay closer attention and make sure that we're not letting this spiritual disease creep in and take over? For me, managing diabetes is several things. First, it's insulin wherever I go. I don't even go to the grocery store without it. It's also paying attention to my body, what I eat, what I don't eat. It's exercise, less than I should, but I do. And in this case, the writer is talking about food, right? Milk versus meat. So I figured we would use the acrostic eat. Examine yourself. That's the first part. It's hard to be self-reflective in our always-on world where email, Twitter, Facebook, all Instagram, it's all right here. A friend of mine told me a story this week. Uh, he works with, with teenage boys, and a 15-year-old that he knows said this past week they removed TikTok from their phone completely. Now, some of you don't know what that is. Find your nearest teenager and ask them. Okay? Um, it's predict particularly addictive for a lot of teenagers. He removed it completely because it was becoming a problem for him and he knew it. And he said there was at least one time during the week where he really wanted it and wished it was on his phone, but it wasn't. And he said, I was bored but it was okay. And that right there is the beginning of maturity, of wisdom. Sometimes it's okay. And we need to be willing to shut things off when they are taking over our, our, our lives. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. He's writing to a church. This is not about checking boxes and saying, yep, I agree with that. This is about whether or not we, not the person down the row from you, not your neighbor, but we are spiritual infants. Do we believe in a way that it works its way out into the lives that we live on a day-to-day -day basis? And we can't do this on our own. We need both God and one another. David, in Psalm 139, cries out to God. He says, Know my heart. Purge me of any wicked way within me. Trade my ways for your ways, God. Psalm 51 is a prayer of repentance for David after a pretty horrendous sin. It's a confession. And he asks God in verse 10 to clean his heart. But then in verse 13, there's this verse that we often overlook. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. That's important because David is basically saying, even though I have messed up beyond belief, I can be redeemed. Matthew 18, Jesus says, confront the brother who sins against you. Why? Not to get them, but to restore the relationship. In James chapter 5, we read that we are to lift up the person who finds somebody who's wandered from the faith and brings them back. You see, if we have backslidden, it's not the end. God can and will restore. And like David, the story of God's grace lives on in us and not only restores us, but can be used by God to restore others. But that self-examination is not enough. We also need an appropriate diet. We know that we cannot make our entire lives work on a diet of fast food. We might want to, but it's a bad idea. And just like that, you also cannot take food that is just for infants as an adult. It don't, doesn't do the job. And if our spiritual diets consist merely of the things that we learned when we were little kids, there's a problem. You need to go deeper. It's not good enough. And too often, maybe we feel like, I, I can't do that. It's too advanced. It's kind of like me in pre-calculus. Not a chance. Can't do it. 
But there's a problem with that kind of thinking because way back when, when I was 17, I actually did do pre-calculus. I mean, I wasn't great, but I did it. We have to stretch and grow and learn, and all of us, adults and kids, can grow deeper. Look, if teenagers in high school can do pre-calculus and chemistry and world history, they can handle the Bible, and so can we as adults. It's not that difficult. We can and must have an appropriate diet. We have to stop looking just for the things on the lowest shelf that are easy to get at and digest. We have to stretch and be willing to go beyond what we're comfortable with. And we might actually find out that not only can we do it, we actually enjoy it. Third thing, we need to train regularly. Why do athletes train? Why do they practice? It's not just to get stronger or build endurance, although that's part of it. Right? You run drills and watch tape and do it all over again to create muscle memory so that when you get into the game, you do not think. You do. You know what to do, and it's natural. It's a part of what your life is. You do it because you know. And that's what's going on here with this distinguishing good from evil. You are so steeped in who God is and what he's about that you don't have to think, you just know. It's not just about what lives on in our minds. It's about, it's not about categorizing people bad, good, bad, bad, good, it's, and looking down our noses at them. It's not about that at all. It's are we putting the work, the effort into our faith that it's become such an integral part of who we are that we live it out on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can go on to the deeper truths, not leaving those, those elementary truths behind, but building a foundation on them. Just after the quote I read from N.T. Wright earlier, he says this about the point of the passage. What the writer here longs for is that people should become proficient in the entire message of God's healing, restoring, saving justice. He wants them to know their way around the whole message of Scripture and the Gospel to be able to handle this message in relation to their own lives, their communities, and the wider world, and to see how all the different parts of God's revelation fit together, apply to different situations, and have the power to transform lives. And just like athletes, we don't train alone. We train with one another. We, plural, are the body singular of Christ. And as the writer of Hebrews says later in 1024, we're to spur one another onto love and good deeds. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says, encourage one another, build one another up. This process of growing and becoming is not an individual one. Yes, I have to put in the work, you have to put in the work, but we do not do it alone. So let's get really practical in the last couple of minutes. What do we do? Like, what do I do? This is the part where the preacher says, read your Bible and pray, right? It's the cliche, but it's true. Where do we start? Here's a few suggestions. First, create a habit. Just like exercising your body gets easier when you have a regular time and a regular place and a regular setup, it's easier when we're consistent. Second, don't do it alone. This is the point of small groups in many, many ways, right? Because even if we're only checking in with somebody once a week, tell them what you're learning. Let them ask questions. Let them challenge you. Help one another grow. Third, I would suggest reading and praying the Psalms. Here's why. The psalmists are real. They are raw. They say the things that nobody it says politely in church, right? They can be shocking, and they will help us to be more real as we explore God and as we learn who he is and what he's about. Four, don't bite off too much. Look, we're about, what, six weeks away from resolution season, right? And what happens every January 1st? 
We make resolutions. I'm going to work out for an hour every day. I'm going to eat kale, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I won't even smell bacon. Right. No, you won't. Start small. Start small, get in a rhythm, then push yourself. That's the way exercise works, right? That's how you get better and stronger. Finally, be willing to go beyond your own comfort zone. The way that we build muscle when we work out is by pushing ourselves further than we think we can, right? And when we're young, it's a lot easier. Your body recovers way faster than it does when you are closer to 50 than you are 40. Trust me, I know. But we still have to push. That's part of what we do even when we're older. So maybe you try a passage that you don't normally go to. Or you read a book by someone who seems too deep. I recommend, well, I already quoted Jerry Bridges, but I recommend J.I. Packer or C.S. Lewis. Sometimes you won't get it all, but that's okay. The idea is what have you learned? How have they pulled you? They don't put everything on the lower shelf. They put it at the one you just have to reach for a little bit. The point is stretching. So as we close, where are you? Have you backslidden? Are you in danger of it? Do you have people in your lives that are in danger of it? Hopefully, you've seen in this passage that it's both a real and imminent danger, but also that it's not the end. That God gives us the opportunity to come back because starting very shortly, the writer of Hebrews goes right back to these deep things. The challenge is laid for us. And after all, if Jesus is truly the greatest of all time, as this entire series is about, then we ought to be willing to do what it takes to know him better and to be like him. him. That is what the writer of Hebrews is inviting us to do. That is the challenge for today.